Today we're talking about polyprotic acids. Some acids possess more than one ionizable proton. And uh, usually successive ionizations of polyprotic acids only contribute a small amount of additional hydrogen ion. So it is useful, though, nevertheless, to know how to calculate the concentration of the various species in solution. We took as an example phosphoric acid. Phosphoric acid, acid has three ionizable protons, and I'll show the three successive ionizations. Uh, it starts off with the formation of dihydrogen phosphate, and uh, Ka, the, the K for the first ionization is 7.5 times 10 to the minus 3. Then the dihydrogen phosphate ionizes to become hydrogen phosphate, and it releases another proton. But you'll notice now that the Ka sub 2 value, the second ionization constant, is um, 100,000 times smaller, 6.2 times 10 to the minus 8. So right away we can tell that the amount of hydrogen ion that's going to be released from the second ionization is going to be so small compared to the first ionization that it's likely to be insignificant. And finally, the third ionization where uh, hydrogen phosphate ionizes to form phosphate and, and yet another hydrogen ion has another 100-fold, 100 100,000-fold smaller value. So again, the value for the third ionization is going to be um, 1 times 10 to the minus 10 times smaller. I went, sorry, 1.0 times 10 to the positive 10 times smaller than the value of Ka1. So both of these values are going to have a very small impact on the actual pH of the solution. Three protons are ionizable, but in practice only the first ionization actually contributes significantly to the pH. Recall that the auto ionization of water also contributes a hydrogen ion concentration of 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7. So compare that to these two values and you'll see that even the auto ionization of water is more significant. Uh, so let's find out just how much hydrogen ion we get from the first ionization. We'll set up a nice table where we depict the chemistry of the first ionization and we're asked for a 0.45 molar solution of phosphoric acid. So we, in, the, in the similar way as always we always do with weak acids. We assume a certain amount X will um, dissociate so that we get 0.45 minus X at equilibrium. Dihydrogen phosphate forms in the same amount as this breaks down, so we get plus X forming, and at equilibrium there's X amount, and the H plus is also the same thing, X amount. So we set up an equilibrium equ uh, equation, 7.5 times 10 to the minus 3, which is the first ionization constant of uh, phosphoric acid is equal to x squared over 0.45 minus x. That is uh, the concentration of dihydrogen phosphate times the concentration of hydrogen ion divided by the concentration of phosphoric acid. That's what these numbers represent. I forgot what that went down. But I think by now you understand what that equilibrium means. So the first assumption I made was to assume that x is going to be a lot less than 0.45. I did it on purpose, even though it's not really true. It's not really true that x is a lot smaller than 0.45. But by using the iterative method of calculation, you still converge on the correct answer. If you just do enough iterations, you eventually get the correct answer anyway. So this is not really true, strictly speaking, but let's go through it anyway. I approximated this equation by eliminating the minus x part. And then I solve for x squared each time. Each time I get a value for x, I plug it back into the original equation. So the first time I solve it, I get x1 equals 5.8 times 10 to the minus 2. I take that number, plug it into here, and x sub 2 turns out to be 5.42 times 10 to the minus 2. Then I plug it in again, and I get 5.44. 5.44 minus 2. Once it remains the same for three iterations, or because it's changing only beyond the third decimal place, I know it's going to have no effect on my final value because I can only report it to two significant figures anyway. But just to make sure, I went a little further. When I take that 5.446 times 10 to the minus 2 and plug it into the pH equation calculation, I get a pH of 1.26. Now, to satisfy our curiosity, I wanted to see what would be the effect of the second ionization. So I took the dihydrogen phosphate ion concentration, which is identical to the hydrogen ion concentration from the first dissociation, and I showed how it can also further dissociate. So dihydrogen phosphate 
can further dissociate into um, hydrogen phosphate and another proton. And I took all the initial conditions um, from the final conditions of the previous calculation. We're going to have this much dihydrogen phosphate sitting in solution from the previous dissociation. Um, zero at the outset for hydrogen phosphate. And we have this much hydrogen ion already sitting in solution from the first ionization. And let's assume another amount X of this dissociates so that we get these equilibrium conditions. We plug them into the equation. Now the K sub 2 value is 6.2 times 10 to the minus 8. When we do the math and we use the quadratic formula to do this one, because if we try to use the iterative formula, it gets too messy. The result is we get two values. One is negative, which we discard because it's not possible. And the first value is 6.2 times 10 to the minus 8. That value of x represents the extra hydrogen ion that is dissolved from the second dissociation. Compare that to the 5.4 times 10 to the minus 2 that occurs from the first dissociation. It's 1 million times less. So is that going to affect the pH? Let's find out. We add these two numbers, the 5.446 from the first dissociation, which is here, and the 6.2 times 10 to the minus 8 from the second dissociation, we get this number. When we plug it, we'll plug it back into the pH calculation, we still get 1.26. Same number, no impact on the pH. So we can make a conclusion about the uh, effects of the second dissociation. As long as it's about three orders of magnitude different, you can safely say that it'll have no effect on the pH from the second or even the third dissociation.